Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this week's edition of Bates Nursery Botanical Boot Camp. Uh, today we're talking about a pretty popular topic, especially in the southeast, um, and this is disease and specifically what we can do to treat them and treatment products. Um, there are a ton of diseases and pathogens out there for plants, and really it's about knowing which ones we need to be concerned about, um, and then which ones are acceptable in our landscape, because there are some that are going to exist but not pose a problem to our, our plants. Um, and we'll just kind of discuss those, some of the more common ones in this area, um, as well as the products and methods you can use to control that. So. Um, before we get started, uh, I just do want to make a disclaimer. Uh, we have predicted, and uh, this is thir uh, Wednesday today, that there may be some icing overnight, and it is a possibility that we may close the nursery if this ice makes it um, untravelable or that we can't get out on our lot. So just keep an eye out on all of our informational sources, social media, however you find out about us. Um, check that and see if there's any closure tomorrow uh, a lot of times if the schools are closed locally uh, Bates nurse will be too but just stay tuned just in case that happens tonight um, but we're gonna jump into it so diseases in Middle Tennessee um, and I do have a disease identification chart pulled up on the side here under this camera um, this is from Bonide one of our biggest distributors of uh, treatment products and you can go to bonide.com and they have a ton of information out there there's a really good app you can get on your phone to basically identify um, you can put in your disease and they'll tell you all the treatment products that you can use in that disease so bonide is a great resource um, and this identification chart's a great way to get a gauge on what you're seeing um, as well as what you can use to treat it so um, we'll, we'll kind of refer to that um, just so you can get some ideas of the common diseases um, and I do want to mention that most of what we'll talk about today is a fungal pathogen. Um, there are some bacterial wilts out there, and I'll mention those, but most of what we're going to see is a, is a fungus that's attacking the plant. Uh, so most of these will be fungicides. Uh, and the reason we get fungal issues here, uh, if you go up north into Indiana, Michigan, that fungal pressure really isn't there. One, because they have a shorter season and it's cooler, uh, and then it's also drier. So uh, we get a lot of that in our area because of the hot, humid days, cool nights, um, as well as moisture that can persist. So um, sometimes if we can control any of those factors in the environment, uh, we can reduce the fungus and, and avoid the need to treat or spray anything, which is always good. So um, just remember, if we can reduce um, contact with infected plant, if we can reduce moisture in the environment, uh, we can nip a lot of these problems in the bud. And of course, we'll talk about treatments that you can do as well. Um, I also wanted to mention dead leaves. So some of these pathogens can exist like uh, rust, for instance. Uh, if you have leaves on the ground after your diseased tree has gone dormant and you have leaves on the ground, you want to get those out of your garden beds. This includes uh, compost piles. This includes uh, fruit tree leaves or old tomatoes. It's best to get those out of your garden. Um, especially if you know you have a problem with disease. So just getting rid of infected material can help clean that area. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and jump into the most common pathogens we have in our area. Um, of course, you may have one that I'm not talking about, and, and feel free to type in some questions, and we'll try to address that issue. Um, but I'm going to kind of refer over here to this disease identification chart, and the number one pathogen and probably in the landscape period is leaf spot. Uh, and we should have one on leaf spot, and I'll put my pen to kind of point to it here. Um, leaf spot, which is very similar to anthracnose and black spot, basically all the same pathogens. Uh, leaf spot is literally just speckles and spots on the leaves, and um, it is really hard to find a plant without some degree of leaf spot. The things that cause this is basically water sitting on the leaf. So literally where that water drop sits on the leaf um, is where that leaf spot is going to grow and propagate. So um, keeping our leaves dry, 
not watering from the top, not letting water sit on the leaves, looking out for overhead sources of excessive water. Obviously, Mother Nature is going to provide rain. There's nothing we can do about that, but that will help reduce leaf spot. Um, we'll talk about a couple products, but Fungonil is probably one of the best products. Now, that's a synthetic um, fungicide as well as copper or sulfur fungicides, which would be an organic alternative um, I would use for leaf spot. Again, if you can keep your leaves dry, you may not have a problem in your garden. Uh, number two um, pathogen that I see in our area is powdery mildew. This is really common in edible gardens, um, tomatoes, beans, cucumbers. A lot of these can get uh, powdery mildew. And this is kind of an oddball. This one really um, thrives in an overly dry environment. So um, one way to make powdery mildew worse is to water your plants more in response. This will make that powdery mildew go crazy. So um, powdery mildew is from dry, warm days, cool nights like we get in the spring. Uh, powdery mildew, organic products, copper, sulfur is a great way to go, especially because this is mostly on edibles. So an organic product um, is ideal. I've even seen home remedies using dairy uh, like milk products on the leaves. Um, you could research this if you want for alternatives, um, but basically it's a culture neutralizing that mildew. So we just need to neutralize that fungus um, and it's going to stop the spread um, as well as water your plants. So uh, if we have a big drought in the spring, you'll see a lot of this powdery mildew crop up. Uh, number three is sooty mold. Again, another another fungus. Um, sooty mold is really a, a product of insects secreting uh, sugars. So we see this a lot on hackberries. If y'all are familiar with cars being covered in black soot um, underneath a hackberry tree, that's sooty mold. So um, the main way to control sooty mold is to control the insects, which cause the sugar that the mold feeds on. So if you have a sooty mold, um, it's good to look up, look around the plant. If you have, say, aphid problems, um, you're going to want to go more into an insecticide or a dormant oil to control the insect that's causing that fungus. Um, so that sooty mold, you'll see black on the leaves. And let me go over here to our, um, our example. I think we have sooty mold on here. Yeah, so sooty mold, that's actually a really good example of it. That's probably a rhododendron, um, and it even says use insecticide. So that sooty mold, we're going to treat the insect. Ben, uh, would you mind pointing out powdery mildew, too? I think we Yeah, I think the... I skipped powdery mildew. Is that on the bottom here? Uh, yeah, so powdery mildew. Um, powdery mildew is pretty easy to identify. It's going to have this white, um, really it's like the mycelium of the fungus, so you're going to get kind of a white um, fibrous coating on the edges of the leaf, sometimes into the center. Um, so that's powdery mildew. That's lilac, definitely a problem, very common in lilac in our, our landscape. Can you see that on the camera? Yes. Okay. Uh, I've also seen it on squash, right? Yeah, so squash, um, cucumbers, anything in that kind of vining vegetable family, um, huge problem. Again, it, it's usually um, drought, not water that's causing the problem. So. And now it, it may look like it's being over overwatered, but in fact, it's it's the drought causing that. Um, so we talked about powdery mildew, city mold, uh, rust, and this is one really common in fruits in our area. Um, rust is usually an orangish red pustule. That's why it's called rust. It looks like um, rust you get on on your car, for instance. Um, this is a fungal pathogen that's stored in that leaf material, even dead leaf material, um, and it actually forms what's called a pustule. And then when the wind blows or it rains, it opens those up and it spreads. And this can be really bad because it it you know if we get heavy wind in the spring, it's going to spread that rust. Um, again, this is a host on infected plants. Uh, the picture is raspberry. I see it a lot on apples. So we get a cedar apple rust. Um, generally fruit trees, raspberries, blackberries. If you grow hops, rust is a real problem with hops. Um, 
with this rust, it's really about keeping your area clean. So if you notice rust, you need to get rid of any leaves that have rust on them. Um, get them off the ground, get them off the plant. If you have nearby sources of rust, then you just need to find a way to reduce that airflow um, into that area. There are some products um, to help. So funganil would be your um, synthetic, and then copper fungicide would be a good uh, dry product to put on that leaf. Um, again, that's just going to stop the spread. If you can get rid of infected material, uh, you're going to have much better luck controlling rust. Again, this is really a common problem in edible fruit tree, fruit bushes. So um, if you're trying to produce a lot of fruit, it, it might be um, a good idea to preventively treat for rust because once it kind of takes hold in those plants, it can be kind of a persistent problem. Uh, blight, uh, so blight something we tend to see in, in the warm up in the spring, so April, May, when we have these wet, um, warm night temperatures. So blight, fire blight specifically tends to attack um, our pear trees uh, and other edibles. The best thing to do is to plant a resistant species. So if, if you can get a species of tree that's resistant to blight, um, plant that you know if you can if you know you have a blight issue maybe stay away from anything in the prunus family the pear family um, they tend to be susceptible so you know if you have an option not to plant one of those um, definitely do it uh, that'll really help with the blight again um, copper or we do have a biofungicide which is a, a bacterial based fungicide those would both work for blight um, Again, it tends to happen in bigger, more mature trees. I see a lot of this, and you just may not be able to get up to those leaves. So um, definitely plant-resistant varieties first because uh, it can be hard to control blight. And, and then the last really common um, pathogen I see in this area is wilt. And, and this is the one that's a bacterial instead of fungal. So it's a bacteria um, caused by insects feeding on that plant and passing that bacteria. Um, kind of like a mosquito can pass disease uh, when it bites us. When, when these insects bite the plant, they're pushing that pathogen, that, that bacterial pathogen, into the plant. Um, and so with wilts, and let me show you all a wilt. Uh, sorry, I, I skipped blight. So blight, there's tomato blight on here. Um, ben, uh, we're getting a reflection. If you could pull that down or sure. move it to the yeah, left. Let's, let's pull it down. Um, I'm used to blight on uh, pear trees a lot, which uh, I don't know if I have a secondary. Here, I'll go ahead and put this in front of there. So fire blight is a real common one. I think you should be able to see that. It, you're typically going to get these really black curly tips in the warm spring season. Um, that's very typical of blight. Again, moving back to uh, this kind of identification chart, you know, you'll get blight on tomato. It's going to have black curled leaf tips for the blight. Um, and then the wilt. Uh, let me see. It's kind of hard to look at it from this angle. Uh, the wilt. Uh, where did I see wilt? How am I missing it? Is there wilt on here? Yeah, we may not have wilt on here, um, but like damping off, that's gonna be real similar to wilt. I do believe I have wilt in this book real quick. Let me see. Yeah, so here's some example of, this is a fusarium wilt. Let's see if I can put that where you can see it without a gloss. Um, so here's some tomatoes, um, wilt. I mean, you're literally it, gonna uh, get- Bring it down just a hair, just a bit. Bit. like probably a couple inches, yep. Yeah. So wilts, you know, you're going to get literally this, the, the ends of the plants are going to curl and wither pretty quickly. Um, again, this is a bacterial problem. So it's in the system of the plant. Um, wilt can progress pretty quickly. It's going to be very quick and obvious. Um, again, these kind of curled um, ends of growth. A lot of times you'll see it on the new growth of the plant. Uh, and again, this is about controlling the insect that 
causes the wilt. Um, also, if you have plants that are planted really close together, this can increase the likelihood because those insects are going to jump around uh, between the plants. You ben, see, uh, could you also uh, go back to blight and kind of hold it maybe a little bit closer to the camera? Mm -hmm. Seems like we're still having a glare problem with that. Yeah, blight. Um, I wish I had a better picture of blight. We see that right there. <laughs> uh, where is it? Oh, fire blight? Yeah. Yeah, bring it a little bit closer to the camera. I think it, it'll focus closely. And then kind of bring it up a little bit, like away from you. There we go. Yeah. So blight, um, this is a pretty easy one to see in the spring. Everything tends to get blight all at once with a, a warm-up of weather. It's literally going to turn uh, the new growth, the new leaf growth on your plants black. I mean about as black as you can get it. It's, it's sometimes brown, but it tends to turn very black just about overnight with a warm-up. So very um, definite. I think there was, uh, I'll go to the blight on these. So, you know, I don't know if you can see that, but the early blight on the tomato uh, and same as the potato. So the late blight, um, you're literally going to get a black curling um, on the new growth at the tips of that plant. So, and blight progresses very quickly. Uh, we do have some questions if you want to do sure. a little question yeah, break. Yeah, we'll take a break here for okay. a second. Um, let's see. Uh, Ingrid's asking about um, treatment for a sickly-looking ginkgo. Uh, the leaves turned yellow-brown prematurely, fell off in the summer and not the fall, mm -hmm. and there was some thinning of the leaves. Um, yeah, and I can go ahead and, and already say ginkgo. Um, ginkgo is known to have very few pathogens that attack it. Um, so my first instinct with ginkgo without seeing the plant where it's located um, is that it's actually not a fungus, that it's actually an environmental issue. So it could be weather, it could be soil, so it could be too wet, it could be trunk rot, um, which, which rots are a fungus, but typically it's a result of just too much water. Um, so yeah, with a ginkgo turning brown yellow prematurely, I, I would lean towards um, either sitting too wet, planted too deep, or a sudden weather change. So um, if it's a relatively new plant and we get a hard weather change, um, you could see premature dropping of leaves. Sometimes if it's a newer plant, those leaves will just naturally drop early as it acclimates. So um, with your ginkgo, the good thing is every year it's going to reset and put on new leaves, um, get rid of any old leaves on the ground before they bud out. And then just take a look. As long as it puts on new growth in the spring, uh, likely is the plant is, is perfectly okay. Um, like I said, ginkgo is one that I would assume it's not a fungal pathogen. Um, ginkgo have been around since dinosaurs, and one of the big selling points is how um, little problems they have in environment, pollution, and disease. That's why they've been around so long. So, yeah, I'd wait and see until spring and see what your ginkgo does. Okay, and then she also mentioned, uh, and I don't think we've talked about this yet, shot hole fungus on laurel bushes. Yeah, and and I will actually, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and do a spiel on shot hole fungus because um, this is super common. Um it's, it's really something that you can treat with a copper fungicide, um, but I typically think if you're treating with a copper fungicide, you may be better suited to a different plant because you're going to have to continually treat it. Um, so laurel, anything in this prunus family, the laurel, so we sell uh, auto lucan, skip laurels, very common, English laurel, um, and then on, on my talk last week, uh, or the week before, we did mention for a hedge plant, there's a chestnut hill laurel that's more resistant. Um, shot hole fungus is very similar to um, leaf spot. Um, and it, it's really, it really is an anthracnose. So it's basically a, a fungus that's growing in the spot of these leaves on the laurels. Um, 
I have never seen a laurel 100% free of this shot hole fungus. Um, it, it's endemic to the species of plant, and typically I see it worse whenever the plant has been um, hit with irrigation or been overwatered from above or been excessively pruned. Um, all of these things on laurel make a tighter plant, and that tightness reduces airflow, which keeps water on those leaves, which causes the shot hole. So um, the best looking laurels I see are planted a good spacing away from each other, away from the house, and honestly, they get left alone. Um, laurels that don't get pruned, they don't get excessively watered, tend to look the cleanest. Um, so with the shot hole fungus, you know, send us a picture. We can see how far it's progressed. Um, my general rule of thumb is if you don't notice the shot hole from about 10 feet away, you're okay with it. That's an acceptable level. I wouldn't be treating it. However, if it if it's enough to bother you um, from 10 feet away, uh, then you either need to treat it or think of another plant because Typically, they all get it to a certain degree. So, yeah, shot hole fungus, really common one. We're going to treat that as a leaf spot or an anthracnose. Um, again, copper fungicides usually recommended. Um, but if you um, reduce shearing, reduce pruning on your laurels, give them a little fertilizer in the spring, give them more sun, let them dry out, uh, a lot of times the new growth won't have that shot hole fungus. So, um, if you are going to treat for the shot hole, you need to do it in the spring and continually through the summer as that pathogen grows. So um, shot hole fungus, super common. I'm not worried about it if I see a little bit on the plant, but if it's all over like Swiss cheese, um, then we need to take pretty decisive action. Uh, let's see. Got another question here, PJ. Um, <clears throat> what can you use on citrus for cottony cushion scale? I've sprayed both spinosad soap and bonide orchard spray repeatedly and still finding them. Yeah. So um, we're talking about citrus, which is a tropical. Um, and, and scale is an insect. So we're not even talking about a fungal pathogen here. Um Scale is an insect that's a lot like, uh, say, a barnacle in the ocean. So they don't really move. They're going to latch onto that plant and just suck the life out of it. Um, but they have a hard shell, so they're very hard to treat. Um, so I don't know that the orchard spray is actually going to do anything to the scale. Um, and because of that shell, timing is really important on scale. And, you know, um, some of our ladies in the garden center would probably know a little more specific about timing. Um, but with that scale, I would be using a dormant oil or a neem oil. And those are organic products. And what that's going to be doing is it's literally going to coat that scale and smother it and, and get it to die. Um, now, once you've done that, you may not see that scale fall off. So sometimes those are dead. You may need to wait and continually treat them. Um, you know, we don't recommend doing an oil treatment, uh, a dormant, excuse me, a dormant oil treatment when it's hot outside because you'll likely burn the plant. Um, but yeah, with that scale, it's either got to be a, a systemic insecticide, which is kind of my last resort. Um, and, and they're only going to take that up certain times of the year or a dormant oil and typically dormant oil is done, um, through the winter, hence the name dormant oil or neem oil, kind of the same product, um, is what I would use for scale. Soft cushiony scale is as far as what I know can be really, uh, aggressive. So just whatever you need to do to treat that keep that away from your other plants because that scale can move so um, remember scale is an insect even though it doesn't move best thing you can do is spray dormant oil um, on a regular basis to smother that scale okay and uh, last question before we'll break for a minute um, uh, how do you get rid of infected materials send it out in the trash is the only option no, I mean, you just need to get it away from your plants. Um, you know, you, you can use, you can put 
um, infected disease material in compost, but you need to wait for a season or two before you use that compost um, because you want that disease to really settle. Um, so what a lot of people do is they'll have a secondary compost pile um, further away from their gardens and their plants, and you can dump your leaf, your leaf matter, your tissue and disease plants um, a good bit of distance, so maybe at least 50, 100 feet away from your plants that you want to take care of. Um, put that disease material in its own section far away so that basically those diseases can peter out. Um, if the fungus doesn't have a living plant to attach to, um, it, it may not become a problem and over time um, bacteria will eat away that fungus in that material. So separate it from your active compost, have a secondary compost for infected material. Um, if you're outside of Davidson County, you can burn. So you can burn that infected material and just to get rid of it um, or throw it in the garbage. I mean, that's not, um, you know, if you're on a small property and you don't have room for a disease compost pile, um, yes, to stick it in the garbage. Um, I'll usually use a leaf blower and any disease leaf material I will blow out of my bed out of that area into my lawn, chop it up, and just let it go um, into the lawn. I'll just try to keep it away from my production beds and my landscape. Um, a lot of people talk about sterilizing. I, I kind of don't like that word. That sounds really aggressive. Um, we just need to get the bulk of that disease material a good distance away from your garden. Um, if you've got a lot of disease problems, then yeah, throwing it in the garbage uh, is, is not a bad option. Okay, um, we're going to kind of jump back in. Uh, we kind of just talked about common disease problems in the landscape. Um, I'm going to talk real quick about methods because sometimes it can be a little confusing. How do I put this on my plant? What do I use? Um, and to my right here, I have a couple of the more common methods. Um, and, and there's two basic products, wet and dry products. Um, so the wet products are more common. I think they are probably the more effective method generally. Um, so you can use a hand sprayer, which is just basically just a pump sprayer. A lot of these products come pre-mixed with a pump sprayer. Um, basically, this is for a, a, a smaller area because you're going to be using your hand to actually apply this. And, and generally with these liquids, we just want to coat the leaf material, the infected material, to the point of runoff. So we don't want um, these products showering down in our soil. We want to spray them until they're nice and glossy and then back off before it starts dripping. Uh, if you put too much on, it'll actually pull that product off the leaf. So um, hand sprayer is a great option for a pre-mixed, ready-to-go option. Um, if you have an entire orchard, this is probably not uh, a good method. It's probably going to wear you out and take forever. Um, so that's why we have pump sprayers. You know, we sell solo pump sprayers. You can do backpack sprayers. Um, they're all good options. The great thing about a sprayer um, is that you can buy concentrate. So if you know you're going to be doing fungicide treatments over and over and over again, um, you can buy a concentrate. So, so basically, a more affordable version that can go a lot longer. You're going to mix it with water um, based on the directions on the label. It varies for every product. Um, and with that sprayer, you're just going to be mixing a certain amount of the concentrate with water. Uh, this is great because you can reach further up on a plant. You can adjust your stream. Um, you can really have a lot of options for covering a large space and treatment with a sprayer. Um, again, the reason you wouldn't do it is, is cost. You know, you need to buy the sprayer. Um, and then the cost of the concentrate is going to be more expensive. Again, it's going to go a lot longer. This is the equivalent of buying in bulk. Um, but yeah, a sprayer, this is my preferred method because I can easily um, treat many different problems on different plants and I can adjust for that. Especially if you have a larger area. 
Um, we do also sell products with hose spray attachments on them. Uh, and this is also going to be a premix product. So if you don't want to have to deal with mixing with water, um, basically you just hook the hose up to this. Uh, there are um, singular methods of this that's not pre-mixed and you can mix it in there but basically your hose is going to go in one end turn on your hose pick your setting and then you're just going to spray your garden and it'll meter it um, this is a good option if you're just doing bulk fungicide so this is an orchard spray if you have a whole lot of blueberries or really large fruit trees um, the downside to this product is you're going to get uh, a less accurate mix and you're also going to get a rougher coverage so if you're really trying to get this to stick to small leaves um, you're gonna have a hard time with the hose but if you're doing a very large area so like lawns or large trees or lots of bushes um, this is a real convenient easy thing for a homeowner so that that's a hose attachment they have adjustable nozzles on the end of them Okay, so those are wet. There's also dry products, and we have a bunch of those dry products. Um, again, not that they're less effective. You do just have to be very aware of rain. Um, these products, typically, if we get a nice hard rain, you're going to need to reapply them for them to be effective. So that, that's going to be the drawback. Um, we sell these in shakers. So these shakers are pre-mixed. This is probably the most convenient method. Uh, basically, you pop the cap, um, and they've got a little hole here, and you just spread it on the leaf. You know, th the good thing is you're going to see what's covered visually with the powder, um, which is great for a first-time uh, gardener trying to do something simple. Most of these are organic products that are dry. So you just shake these on the affected area, get them to stick. Again, if it rains, you may need to reapply. There's also dusters. You know, this is kind of... Uh, uh, called an old school thing you know people have been doing these for a long time it's basically a little pump sprayer you know we've seen a lot of antique you know these in antique stores um, but yeah you're just putting the dry product in here and you pump it and that kind of gives you a nice light mist if you're going to do a larger area but you like the dry products um, you can get a plant duster um, and, and just dust that area and get a nice mist on the leaves so you get better coverage. Um, there are hand spreaders as well. I recommend those more for lawn treatment, which we won't really get into a whole lot today. Um, but if you're going to be treating your lawn, um, best thing is going to be a dry granular product in a spreader, hand spreader, um, walk behind spreader. Any of those are good for lawns. Hey, um, Ben. Yeah. You mind if we uh, answer a few more questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. What went wrong with the crepe myrtles around Nashville last year? I noticed many not producing their usual lush foliage and flowers. Yep. Is there hope for them to do better this year? Yeah, so that, that was actually a weather-related um, incident. Now, there are uh, insects and pathogens that attack crepe myrtle, but this really had nothing to do with that. Um, Crepe myrtle is hardier further south, not necessarily further nor north. And last year we had um, a really late warm up, and crepe myrtle really waits for it to get really warm to start growing. Well, unfortunately, we had it get really warm, and then we had it freeze really late. And and that's something that generally we can't do anything about. You know, if if you live in uh, a place that has high wind exposure, um, you may have lost your crepe myrtle to the ground. So in this case where we have a large warm-up growth and then we have a hard freeze, basically all that tissue in that crepe myrtle has been frozen down to the ground or burned down. Um, we saw crepe myrtles that didn't get damaged at all. We saw crepe myrtles that died halfway down. We saw crepe myrtles that died down to the ground and they start to sucker. So um, short answer is it depends on how bad your crepe myrtle got affected um, if it were me and my crepe myrtle died all the way to the ground i would probably replace it um, because those suckers are going to take a while to form a new tree basically you're starting from the ground up um, if your crepe myrtle didn't get damaged 
a lot. It should be fine this year, and it really just depends on our slow, easy warm-up in April. Um, you know, just cross your fingers, watch the weather. Um, don't do any extra fertilizing in April. Probably wait until uh, May, really. Uh, May or June to fertilize crepe myrtles so that we're not pushing them. Um, so yeah, don't push your crepe myrtles early. Um, again, there's not a whole lot you can do about late freezes, um, but just you know, take inventory of your crepe myrtle and how long it's going to take to get back to normal. Um, happens every so often. All right, how about um, recommended fertilizer for laurel bushes uh, to kind of help them be more resilient to the type of fungus if that's possible and also will neem oil help with laurels uh so again with the laurels and the fungus the main way to control that is to control our pruning practices and our watering practices um, fertilizer is going to help it grow which is great um, but if if there's existing moisture problems, pruning problems, it is going to attack that new growth. So the fertilizer is great, but it doesn't really affect the fungal pathogen, the leaf spot. Um, and like I said, really the thing to do is to let that plant dry out. If it's in a shady, wet location, um, your only option is going to be to treat it with a fungicide or to move it or to let sun and air in. So um, if you're going to fertilize laurel, something 15% or under nitrogen, um, any product, Osmocote, you can use Hollytone for evergreens, and that'll kind of help it uh, green up a lot faster. Um, but again, for controlling the, fun the, the fungus, it's really what we call a cultural practice. So the way we take care of them in the landscape really has the biggest impact on that fungus. And for folks who have additional questions about fertilizer, um, for those who have not viewed it, we did have one about demystifying fertilizer mm -hmm. labels. Uh, Austin Lowen did that one. He did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of covers the broad base of most fertilizer you'll work with. Yeah. Uh, we'll get a link posted in here in a moment. Yeah. Um, and and if your plant is is um, weak and unhealthy and you you don't have a fertile soil, then that that can lead to pathogens. So the fertilizer, as far as just keeping your plants um, healthy and happy and growing, um, that is a good kind of secondary way to help control issues. If you have a happy, healthy plant you're not going to get as much stress um, from disease. And then uh, the last one for the moment, um, what's your best way to deal with Japanese beetles? Is there a trap that works well? Uh, a hose set to rocket mode, the, the, the like high pressure mode, is probably the most effective way in my opinion. Um, you can spray the beetles but by the time you're spraying the beetles they've already hatched they've already done their damage and they're probably almost gone um, japanese beetles tend to come out for a few weeks during the year and they do all their damage then um, so as far as treating the japanese beetles on the plant the best way to do it is to get a hose at high pressure and literally knock them physically off the plant shake the plant get them off that way um, Insecticides tend not to work on beetles very well because they're hard shell. So I wouldn't personally use an insecticide. Um, there are two secondary methods to control them. Um, one is a milky spore, and this is something you can start doing in your soil. Uh, so all beetles, Japanese beetles specifically, come from grubs in the ground. So if you have a lot of grubs in your soil, they're all going to hatch to be beetles. If you treat your soil with milky spore for a few years, it's going to reduce the grubs and therefore reduce the beetles. So milky spore is a great way long term to control Japanese beetles, um, as well as bait. So there are bait traps out there for beetles. Um, you'll see them on hooks out in people's yards sometimes. Um, the catch with this is you want that beetle 
bait bag, that beetle attractant to be way away from the plants you want. So basically you're going to give them a food source, a way to capture them uh, away from your plants. So yeah, so literally physically, mechanically getting them off your plant with water, your hands, and then milky spore in the soil, and then maybe bait bags is how I'd take care of them. Let's also uh, address a uh, kind of occasional phenomenon here, one that's supposed to be happening this year, cicada broods hatching. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that similar to how Japanese beagles, beetles return every year? They do over nest in the ground, right? Yeah, I'm not sure that milky spore, now like I said, I could be wrong, I'm not sure milky spore addresses specifically cicadas. Um because they, they have a little bit of a different growth habit. I mean, as far as cicadas go, I'm pretty sure there's not a lot you can do. You know, if we have a large brood, a large hatch. Um, that's, Save for netting, maybe, right? Yeah, netting. So that's a pretty cyclical thing. It's like, you know, if you can rely on that hatch of cicadas, it's going to happen no matter what you can do. But we can be prepared. So, yeah, you can put netting over your plants, Um that's why it's a real problem um it's more of a problem for like farmers you know because if it hits their crop it'll just decimate it yeah um new newer branches too right right Younger. so they're going to get the fresh stuff and, and you know if you don't have a ton of food for them they're not going to hang out in your garden so you know unless you have a, a field full of plants or a, or a large crop they're, they're probably not going to mess with you. Um, then again, it's mechanical. You know, these these insects are big. If you can physically hit them, once you knock them off, usually they're not going to come back. Um, get a bird feeder. You know, birds are going to eat cicadas. If you bring birds into your garden, um, they're going to help you control it. Uh, Ingrid's asking about black spot on roses. Yeah. So black spot on roses, um, super common. Um, the, there's a picture on this identification chart that is a rose for sure, black spot. Um, with roses, the best thing you can do is keep them in a full sun, dry location, and do not water the leaves. Um, I think roses are super easy. Uh, you tend to get black spot on the inside leaves. It's not something I would worry about unless it's on the entire plant um if it's on the entire plant it's usually a result of overhead water um again you could treat it with a copper fungicide you could use um funganil a synthetic fungicide on the roses but typically if you cut your roses back every year really low to the ground um, fertilize them a lot and then remove any foliage with black spots it shouldn't spread um, with roses, that gets into the debate of what's an acceptable level of black spot. Um, most all roses are going to get black spot to some degree, um, but you can keep it looking good. So we just need to keep the water out of the rose, let all the sun and air flow you can into that rose, and that should help with your black spot. As they grow, they'll get it. Just remove all that old uh, leaf material, and that'll help a lot. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions we have for now, so okay. you want to pick back up? Yeah, and, and we're actually jumping into specific products now because um, we, just, we just talked about methods to apply, wet and dry methods, um, like I said, Wet methods, little better coverage, uh, last better after rains. The dry method is easier for a uh, beginner, amateur. It's just easier to see. And then you do need to re reapply after rain. So just a review on that. Um, so I do have a bunch of products on the table. Um, I know we probably can't get right up onto the fine print. I can barely read it. Um, but most of these products will be on Bonide's website. And they have a really good, like I said, app um, that you can put on your phone. You can just type Bonide in your app store. And it really does a good job of explaining the products. These labels sometimes rip off. They have all the labels on there and PDF files. So um, as I go through these, just remember how much you treat when you treat 
refer to the label because they can change from year to year from product to product just make sure you read that label um, no matter what i say that label is the law as we say um, so organic products i'm going to touch on organics first and then we'll go into synthetics um, the big difference is, you know, the synthetics are products that have had to be formulated. Uh, the organic products are things found in nature. So um, generally, the organic products are going to be more general purpose. They're not going to be as specific as to what they treat. Um, bonide is real nice, and I'll put an organic and non-organic. Um, bonide is great in that they will put... Um, a brown label on all their organic products and a purple label on all their synthetic products. So say if you're doing an organic veggie garden, fruit garden, stick with the brown label stuff. You know, if you really want to eat, eat whatever you're treating, um, go organic, you'll be a lot better for it. Um, and you can say you've got an organic garden and you don't have to worry about uh, eating from it. Uh, so organic products, we'll talk about the dry ones first, sulfur and copper. Uh, these are two that are used a lot for leaf spot, anthracnose, things like that. Um, so we have a uh, copper fungicide and a sulfur fungicide. Again, these are two basic elements. Um, so naturally occurring. Um, sulfur is usually used for rusts. So that orange kind of pustule looking thing that's on uh, raspberries and apple trees. Uh, and then leaf spots. So like the rose. Uh, we were asked about earlier, you could put uh, a sulfur on the leaves, um, as well as copper. Copper will be used a lot for um, leaf spot, you know, the, the laurels with the shot hole fungus. This would be the product I would use. Again, what we're doing is stopping that fungus from progressing. It's not going to make our leaves that are diseased look better. Um, we still need to get rid of those, um, but if you notice, you know, this fungus, this black spot, anthracnose, whatever, is moving real fast, um, use these to slow the spread of that, uh, especially in the spring and summertime. We got another quick question, uh, sure. maybe off topic, but any tips for controlling moles and voles? Mechanical. Um, again, just like the Japanese beetles, the best way to control those creatures is literally to trap or kill them. Um, you know, I've had people ask me about um, using a grub treatment to control the moles. The problem is if you look at these grub, which we typically don't sell the, uh, the grub insecticide, we'll do the milky spore. Um, that's not labeled to control moles. So you're kind of really breaking the law by using a grub X or a grub killer to get rid of moles. Um, in fact, moles tend to prefer um, worms, like earthworms, not grubs. So you're, we're kind of treating for something that's not existing. Uh, the best way to control them, there are poison worms, there's auditory repellents. Um, probably one of the best ways is to literally pack the soil down behind them. But number one way to control moles is traps. So there are spike traps, there are uh, hoop traps that literally kind of choke them. They're called choke traps. Um, this is what golf courses use as the number one way to control them and that they're also the ones that spend the most money on it. So um, I refer to the golf courses because that's where they lose all their money is moles. They pretty much try to trap them and kill them. That's the best thing you can do to get rid of your moles. Other than that, you're just deterring them. Um, that, that is a very tough one. Uh, moles can be territorial. So if you get one or two moles out of your yard, likely they'll stay away for a while. So, um, and, and again, you said voles. A vole is basically just a field mice, a field mouse on top of the soil. Um, you can use products like shale, rock around your plants, and that'll keep them from digging. With voles, you just want to keep them from digging roots. Some sort of a rock will stop that. Cool. Yeah, and, and that does get kind of into animal control a little bit, which we have to be a little bit careful. You know, obviously, we're not trying to kill 
critters and poison them. So, you know, we try to be a little bit gentle with that topic. Um, you know, poisons are my last resort. Um, but, but trapping them or humanely killing them is, is the best option. Um, okay, so sulfur copper we talked about. Those are pretty common organic products. Um, I have biofungicide here, which is another great, uh, very similar to BT for insects. So this is a bacteria. So it's in the bacillus family. I think it's bacillus... Uh, Ami and So it's a strain of bacillus, uh, very hard to pronounce, but basically this is a bacteria that is going to attack that fungal pathogen. This is going to be more for like your blight, um, you know, leaf blight, um, fire blight, and molds and mildews that you get on your plants. So, um, more for the pathogens that have more of that black color generally, that really dark color. That's what the biofungicide is going to be for. Organic product, um, again, uses a bacteria. And then someone earlier mentioned the orchard spray. Um, this is a great catch-all product for an organic if you're doing um, fruit production, food produc production. Um, I generally recommend if you're growing fruit trees and you want them to be really tasty, edible, similar to a grocery store, you really need to treat them. Um, almost all fruit with all that sugar they have, they're going to get a fungus or they're going to get an insect if you don't treat them. So it's, it's a good idea to do this preventatively. Um, the orchard spray is literally just sulfur, which we talked about, and then pyrethrin, which is an organic insecticide. So this is basically a general purpose fungicide and a general purpose insecticide. I believe they recommend treating every two or three weeks with this product through the growing season. So um, this is one of those products you want to keep on hand for your fruit, um, and you're going to be doing it um, from about mid-spring through the summer up until harvest. So just remember, this is kind of a, an ongoing thing just to prevent um, that fungus or that insect from attacking your fruit trees. Great that this is pre-formulated. You don't have to guess. Um, so that's really the organics. There's probably other organic products out there. Those are the most common ones. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of synthetics. Funganil is probably the most popular. Um, definitely highly recommended. Um, very effective product. What we're looking for is the active ingredient. So this is chlorothalonil. There's another product called uh, myclobutanil. Basically, if it ends in... Uh, NIL, it's a synthetic fungicide most likely. That's what we're looking for. Um, again, funganil is chlorothalonil. This does a variety of leaf spots, blights, rusts, mildew. This is a great general purpose fungicide. Again, um, you know, this is synthetic, but if we're talking ornamentals like roses, I would go for this uh, hands down over the organic. It's going to be a little more effective, um, and it's going to have better coverage, and it's going to take care of more fungal pathogens. So um, funganil for your ornamentals specifically. Um, you can treat edibles with this, but there is uh, a period you don't want to harvest. So um Again, this is chlorothalonil, funganil. This would be probably my most used fungicide, just generally out of all of these. Um, garden foss, I've got garden foss on here. Um, this isn't a bonide product, but basically this is using a phosphorus acid um, to take care of foliar problems. You can also use this as a soil drench. A lot of people use this for root rot. So Phytophthora root rot um, is a fungus. Um, if you have overly wet places, you can do a soil drench. Um, I really prefer finding a way to get that area to dry out over treating the Phytophthora. Um, but yeah, this is a systemic fungicide. So this is one of the only ones you're going to actually use in the soil to help with the fungus. Um, again, it's, it's a phosphorus, phosphoric acid base, um, and it also has a bunch of general problems. Um, fire blight is another one, and then the mildews. 
And that's a concentrate. I think we only carry that in concentrate. Uh, Manko Zeb is the other. Um, now, this is going to be more for blight specifically. And this uses zinc, uh, I believe. Oh, sorry, iron. And an ethylene, so that's going to be your synthetic chemical. Uh, this is more for potatoes, tomatoes, um, early blight, late blight. So if you know you have a problem with blight, um, I mean, I recommend rotating your crops, getting rid of diseased foliage. Um, but if you're just really trying to nip that in the bud, keep it from spreading, um, the Manko Zeb, again, iron, zinc, and ethylene uh, based chemical, that's really what that is, is made for, is for more vegetable production. And I also wanted to kind of do one other product. Now, technically, this is organic. Um, but this is a neem oil. Someone earlier asked about uh, dormant oil, which basically this is a dormant oil mixed with the extract from the neem fruit, which is a, a tropical tree that has insecticidal and fungicidal properties to it. Um, I don't really use this as much personally for funguses, but if you're looking for uh, basically a dormant oil that'll take care of insects, plus some other properties that will really inhibit the growth of fungus. Um, neem oil is a good option. Again, the only thing I wouldn't do is treat um, during hot, hot days. That could burn your plants because this is an oil. Um, but to me, this is really an organic product. Neem comes from an organic uh, tree. Um, so again, neem oil, a lot of you probably already have this neem oil for your indoor plants. Um, great if you just want to add some of that fungicidal property to it. Um, and I've kind of basically gone through everything. Again, you know, we can get really deep on some of these pathogens. Um, you know, if, if you have pictures of the pathogens on your plants we can really try to get accurate um, seeing the cutting or the plant firsthand really can help um, so just to give you all some idea of where to start with these disease problems um, so yeah i'll just kind of open it up for questions and i, I know y'all probably have a few uh if you have any questions go ahead and type them in the chat <clears throat> If you don't have any, then uh, we appreciate you. Oh, okay, here we go. Ingrid says, boxwood blight treatment? Boxwood blight, the treatment is to get rid of the blight, generally. Um, I would want to identify boxwood blight before I treat it. Um, I've had people ask me about boxwood blight, um, and they're worried about it. But to be, uh, to be really... Frank, boxwood blight is not a big issue in this part of Tennessee. Um, boxwood blight has been found on a couple of occasions in Middle Tennessee, but it's not really a common problem in the nursery industry. All of our plants get um, inoculated and treated for boxwood blight. And nine times out of ten, when someone brings a clipping to me, it's some other issue other than blight. Um, because unfortunately, the, the real solution to boxwood blight is to cut out the blighted material or better yet, literally get rid of the entire boxwood and don't plant a boxwood in that spot ever because um, that blight will persist in that bed. So um, boxwood blight is a, a pretty nasty one. And the reason it's so nasty is there's not really a good product to treat for it um, other than sterilizing it can be kind of a dirty word sterilizing our soil which literally means inoculating um, everything in the soil you'd probably want a professional company to do that if you have um, blighted boxwoods most of the blight i've seen has been in old uh, older mature boxwoods again this is where um getting resistant varieties helps you know most of our new boxwood varieties boxwood blight resistance has been bred into those so you shouldn't have to worry about it so um yeah if you're worried about blight definitely recommend making sure it's a hundred percent blight before you treat um because if it is blight the options are few I don't know if I have a picture of blight in here. 
Uh, another question. I don't see them as much here, but when aphids appear, how do you recommend to get rid of them? And that's, uh, sometimes it, that could be a benefit if it attracts uh, insects, right? Like positive insects. Um, it, it can be. Um, and then we're getting into over treating insecticide. So I don't always go to insecticide first because the problem is if you use a general purpose insecticide, you might be killing beneficial insects and the aphids. And then you can actually get more of an aphid problem because you've killed all the good bugs. So, um, be a little careful in treating aphids before they cause a problem. Um, Obviously, if there's enough aphids to cover the underside of your leaves, you're seeing them, um, you should probably treat them. Uh, but yeah, if you're, I mean, really a general purpose insecticide, if you're not eating it, a systemic insecticide is great. Something you can soak and let the plant take it up. Um, just like the Japanese beetles, if you can literally spray those aphids off the leaves, if there's enough of them, you can just knock them off. That's the most organic thing you can do. Excuse me. And then and then again, just an insecticide directed towards aphids. I mean, most of them will affect aphids. Um, again, I try not to spray insecticides in my veggie garden because a lot of times um, we'll have a beneficial insect, like, for instance, ladybugs can move in and take care of those aphids if you don't spray an insecticide. So... Um, that's up to you if you have a problem. You know, if it's obviously the aphids killing your plants, then you should treat. Uh, if you're just seeing the aphids, maybe wait and see and, and see if they get under control with something else. And I'm just going to go ahead and paste a, a link in here. Uh, this is uh, common houseplant pests, and some of these pests also uh, are on things that are outdoors. As well as indoors. Uh, and, and I actually do have the bonide uh, insect. Let's see if they have aphids on here. There, there's a whole bonide section on aphids, and of course, that's going to be number one here. You probably can't see it. But we do have aphid, um, and the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H they have here are the products that treat for it most insecticides will be effective on aphids so um, if you do need to treat most of the insecticides out there will affect aphids they're soft bodied when they're soft bodied yeah yeah and this is also why there's a lot of things out there that eat aphids so um, definitely just it decide whether or not the best course of action is literally killing them or letting something else take care of them okay well I think that that is enough for the questions. So, okay. Ben, if you want to wrap it up. Also, yeah. uh, weather permitting, we will be having on Friday um, how to choose the right pot or container. Carrie's going to take you through that. Uh, next week, we've also got some mm -hmm. good stuff lined up. Again, weather permitting, I've heard we've got snow, so mm -hmm. we'll do our the best we can with that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and my take on snow, y'all, I know it's Middle Tennessee. We kind of have a love-hate relationship with it. Um, snow actually has a lot of nitrogen in it for our garden so you know a little bit of snow on our our uh, garden beds is actually gonna bring some good stuff to them so you know we got to embrace the snow a little bit um you know for lawns and for gardens the snow can actually uh really help our plants so um a little bit will be good it's the ice that we're kind of um getting a little a little um, aware of so if we do have a lot of ice out there in the garden that could possibly do some damage but you know hopefully it's just uh just pretty and not a problem sure enough well everybody stay safe have a good evening we'll see you at the next one thank you